Mr. Dorman. <laughs> Despite me, maybe. You know, I was really hoping he would just be dead. All right, today we are talking about episode five of Murder Drones. This is just gonna be my general thoughts, theories, and minor details that I noticed in N's haunted house memories. We discovered a ton of info, some of it we didn't already infer. But honestly, this was a fun episode. Though I'm not gonna lie, that ending was filthy. Now, I really like the opening of this episode, specifically all the horror elements around N, as this boy is the best boy and just pieces out of there than deal with any of this exorcism nonsense. Like, it's crazy how adorable this kid is. He is a highlight of the show. Voiced by Angel Dust of all people, there is not a bad circuit in his body. Even when Jay is leaving him mean notes, he doesn't care. He believes the best in people. He's always kind, and that's what leads him to be the big brother slash caretaker of this episode's biggest reveal, Sin. Perhaps you'd like to attend the gala with me. She scares me. So let's take our first detour and just discuss Sin. Now keep in mind, I literally just binged this series a week ago. Meaning I have not been waiting for the reveal of this character for as long as longtime fans. But I do find Sin to mostly be a creepy delight. From her AI voice to how she hides behind N or narrates what she's doing, you immediately pick up the fact that there's something not fully right with her. With my general understanding of what the murder drones are, being that they were all fixed or built by Tessa using the parts from the graveyard, which we know as her mom does imply that they all came from the robot mass grave outside. We will not entertain your dumpster pits. Tessa treats them like friends slash pets, who her parents tolerate almost as much as Tessa. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, we're gonna get to Tessa. Now for Sin, I think the reason that she is different from the rest is alluded to by that zombie drone tape, as we get brief cuts of it in the beginning. The summary being, zombie drones are not whatever the hell Uzi and Doll are. It's actually more of a broad term for all the robots who are improperly disposed of, with the experience leaving their data corrupted, with there being a small 0.01% chance of them coming back online. So my working idea is that N, J, and V were all properly disposed of. Sin never was. She was a zombie drone that was aware of what happened to her, being semi-alive when Tessa tried to fix her, but the software corruption still stuck leading to her semi-impaired motor skills and speech pattern. Which you have to admit is pretty zombie-like based on how she shuffles around with her head tilted to the side. And is such a good brother to this girl, he's doing everything he can to protect her. Just downplaying, like yeah, they don't want us, but I'm still gonna be nice and try to ask. And is a protector of the little people, and I like this girl. She is an adorable little psycho, won't lie though, she also suffers from the same problem as the rest of the episode. They're fun, but they feel incomplete. Let me explain. This whole episode is built around teasing information, giving us some backstory on the murder drone's past, how it connects with Sin and the absolute solver. But rather than giving us the next piece of the puzzle, it kind of feels like to me we're getting more implications than anything else. Like, think about it. This whole episode is built around N uncovering a repressed memory about what's in the basement. We finally get there. And what do we actually learn? That Sin was the one who wiped his memory? The implication that the murder drone's ability are based on Sin's modifications, not the other way around? That she was experimenting with dead bodies? It's a lot of cool nightmare fuel, but it's nothing really concrete. There's like no amazing payoff to it. And like, where would they go after this if Doll and Tessa hadn't jumped back into the story? They'd go nowhere as this is kind of a dead end. Unless this reveal pressured V into telling more, the story is just kind of there. So everything we find in the basement is just kind of underwhelming. And another thing that's kind of undercutting this whole episode is that you pretty much know everything that's gonna happen in the first four minutes. No, for real. By the four minute mark, we unambiguously establish that Sin is the absolute solver. She has the exact same voice, and we see the centipede body. And then she proceeds to claim she wants to go to the ball, and in her own words, The flesh demands invitation. Which at that point, you just know there's gonna be a massacre. Everybody who isn't the main character here is gonna die. So while the visuals are fun, it's a haunted house, it's great. But there are very few surprises to be found here, with not enough new info for it to be satisfying, though it is exciting. Overall, this episode is kind of weird to me, as I feel like it's missing the emotional arc that the previous episodes had that made them work. Uzi struggles with being alone, or being scared of losing N. This is the gel that makes these episodes feel satisfying, even as we get that slow drip of reveals and horror moments. But this episode is missing that, and is pretty much the main character here, but we're dealing with a past version of him. This is not our N. It's effectively a different character. 
It's like there's no really room for him to grow or change, or for us to really like get invested in his journey, as what he's doing is not what actually happened that night. I feel like this episode could work better if it played more into N not wanting to confront his past. Lean into how early on, N was resisting and ignoring all of Uzi's attempts to railroad him into the basement. That would make his decision to finally face what happened narratively satisfying. It'd give a point to the episode, then implying information. Instead, it's mostly Uzi having to pressure this old version of N into it without him making the choice on his own that he needs this. We don't get that classic dream world dilemma where he wants to stay here, but realizes that he has to give it up to grow as a person. So while we all are getting all these fun horror moments, all this great nightmare fuel, it doesn't feel as cohesive as I think it needs to be. Like, the closest thing we have to someone sacrificing what they want to get what they need is Uzi letting Doll take the roach key. But I can't really take that seriously since Doll's role in the story is... <laughs> Surprise, motherfucker! She pops into this thing so abruptly, then just dips. I kind of hate it. It really just feels like she's just here to set up a cliffhanger and get the MacGuffin. Boozy giving that thing up isn't the gut punch it needs to be, as she's barely in the episode, so for her to give up finding answers to save her friends, that doesn't really hit. We'd really have to be shown that she was obsessing over finding answers and jeopardizing her friend's safety. Or hell, we could have had V chasing after hunting them in the memory be the actual V, who in this logic is trying to protect N from the truth, and it's his constant kindness that makes her relent and starts dropping the deets on what happened. There's it's just a bunch of little ways I think they could have really strengthened this episode. As to me, this kind of feels like the weakest one so far. It's fun, but it's exciting rather than satisfying. And this episode didn't have to reveal everything. Without that emotional arc for a character, the reveals that we get are not a big enough payoff in my mind. Like to me, this episode just screams theory video goldmine. Also, as a final nitpick, I do think the framing device of this being N's memories isn't doing this episode too many favors. As while it does wonders to create stakes and have a more active story than just watching the past play out, this being a memory N is replaying with a monster trying to erase it kind of causes some instances where I'm not sure if an event actually happened or if it was just a memory being tampered with the program. As the giant bloody angel behind me just disappears. It's there, then it's not. So that flash makes me second guess what actually happened in some of these scenes. Was Sin's centipede body really just hanging around the house, or was that just a corruption from the program? It's really cool both times, but it muddles what little info we actually get, as we can't be entirely sure when certain events happened, or how they actually played out. As newsflash, V's decapitated body is in Sin's lab. I mean, this whole scene either took place before the events of the gala, or it happened afterwards, and we can't be sure which. But that's enough of me being a bummer. Let's talk about the shit I loved from this thing, because there is a lot of it. Starting with the animation. As a casual viewer, you will never really be able to fully appreciate the little details in this show till you're trying to make a thumbnail out of it, and it has driven you to madness. As this show is beautiful, but it is a bitch to rip shots from. From the use of soft focus to guide your eyes in the scene, to the subtle lighting and particle effects that merge the CGI body with the environments, this show is so good at compositing that it looks weird when you cut the character out of the scene. It makes making the thumbnails very difficult. But that's a me problem, and you can't argue with these results. Murder Drones is accomplishing a crazy amount of work for an independent show. As you can kind of imagine something like this, if it was a short film that was like five minutes long that someone took a year to make. But they are dropping 20 minute episodes on the reg. And just like Hell of a Boss, we just gotta salute that. Kind of like the comedy. Ow! Ow! We were buddies! Ow! Like I said in my previous video, this show excels at handling horror and comedy. When it wants to be terrifying, it goes there. But I also think it knows when to let horror happen and when it's time to interrupt it for a joke as there are moments where you do need to line up the mood, and it's okay to undercut some of the tension. Other times, you just gotta scar the children, and the show is able to accomplish this by alternating between scary moments and those that are just intense. And I feel like that triple switch up is what this show excels at the best. Also, always gotta say it, Uzi is a little murder gremlin who I want in everything. The joke about her using name and her trying to downplay her crush on N slayed me. This girl, she's in love, and I love that for her, and I can see why. Though, not gonna lie, this one line nearly gave me a heart attack. Uzi is! She's a kid! Like us, V! Also, the fact that I called her evil Jimmy Neutron only for this episode to reference the show, that's a good feeling. Brain Blast. Also, of course, we gotta talk about Tessa. For someone that I like, kinda just placed as a villain, she was the unexpected MVP here. Honestly, I feel like this episode could easily have just had her be the main character instead of N. 
as out of the new info that we get, most of the stuff that we know for sure is about Tessa in her home situation, as we learn that she genuinely cares for her robots. They are not just a little pet project to her. She was willing to risk her life to go save N, and even if she hates her parents, she is also still willing to fight to save their lives. Which is kind of crazy when you start to realize just how terribly Tessa is raised. Because according to her, she hasn't met many humans before. But the robots are her only friends, and you can see why she relates to them so much. This girl is ecstatic at the idea of going to a ball, but then she winces when she clinks her glasses with Jay. At first, you don't really know what's going on here. You just think something's wrong with her wrist. But then you see her locked up in her room, physically chained to her bed, and you realize that the wrist that's manacled is the same one that was hurting earlier. So it's kind of a safe bet that her parents do this with an uncomfortable level of regularity, which goes a long way to explain why she's so much closer to her robots, but also open up the question of why would she send them away to wipe out the colony? There's a lot of unanswered questions here, but I'm becoming less and less sure if she's going to be the straight up villain of the season. She may still be an antagonist, and if the extremes V was willing to go through to get rid of Sin, I'd imagine Tessa would be willing to go even further. So she's never going to be completely on Uzi's side, and I do wonder if Doll's new eye patch is her trying to cover up her mark of the absolute so that she can still work with Tessa, but judging by the gunshot, I think she's on to her. Also, I love the touch of depicting all the humans as just shadows with glowing eyes. It's a cool way to avoid having to depict actual humans in the show, plus it allows them to have the same eyes as the robots, which is great for visual consistency. And there's probably some other metaphor here too. I am a ghost witch! And I'm tall. <laughs> Overall, I like this episode. It feels a little weird and it's kind of the weakest one for me, as it really does have the vibe of being a setup episode. The ending is funny, don't know how Uzi caught up to them, so I just have to assume that she learned how to teleport. I'm a little bit worried that we're rushing to the finale, but even if this episode was a little bit weak, I'm confident that Murder Drones is going to crush the finale. Though I am curious if we're going to get a season 2. Okay, tell me what you all thought of the episode, like, share, and subscribe people. It's how this channel keeps growing and how I keep making content. It's a grind, but we all gotta do our part. Love you all, peace out.